I lost my son Austin in 2017 to a fentanyl overdose. He was just 24 years old. Uh, people want to know how it started. It started for him, actually. It was a long journey. Probably when he was 14, he had a dental procedure done, and he was prescribed hydrocodone for the pain. And I gave it to him for a couple days. I put it away, and I thought that was the end of it. Because from that time on, it was a problem. Um, a few months later, I found those same pills in his room, and I asked him if he had been taking them, and he said he had. And we talked about it, and I said it was really a stupid thing to do, and um, thought that was the end of it. Kids try stuff, so I didn't think a whole lot about it at the time. I just thought that's the end of it. Kids try things, but it was actually just the beginning. From then on, he started um, doing pills with other kids at school, and um, in his junior year, um, there were rumors going around the school that he was doing pills and the school asked him to leave and a couple of the other kids and and so he left and we take we took him to counseling and he did counseling for six weeks and the very next day he comes out of counseling and he goes to his new school and he's caught buying pills at school and we took him to one of the best rehabs in Charlotte and they did an evaluation of him and they said oh no he's He's not addicted, it's just um, experimental. And he got good grades, he got into Chapel Hill. I'm talking to friends, they said his third year of undergrad, he started doing pills, and that's where the heroin started. Um, I didn't know Austin was doing heroin until a day before he died. We started to notice money was missing, and then um, he would always ask for more money at school, and he always said it was for something for school, but it just got where it didn't make any sense. And by this point, we knew he was doing something. He graduates from undergrad, and he decides he wants to get his master's. And he decides he's going to get his master's in Chapel Hill because urban planning was what he was getting his master's in. And they had a good program there. And actually, I was, I was thrilled. I was like, this is great. Because it's close, we'll be able to keep an eye on him. But it wasn't, it wasn't good. That was really the beginning of a major downfall for him. He, he would come home to visit. Like I said, he lost a lot of weight. He looked disheveled. And it just wasn't good. And so he graduates. He gets his master's. And he came home that night. He was watching a basketball game in the basement. And I said, I'm going to bed, Austin. I said, why don't you come upstairs? And he said, yeah, I think I'll do that. And so he came upstairs and talked to him for, for a little bit. And he was in a really good mood. And um, I went to bed. And then my husband asked me, where's, where's Austin? I said, oh, he said he was going to watch the game. And then I looked down the hall and I saw that he went to his room, but the light wasn't on. So I did not knock on his door. And I wish I had. And at first I go in his room and I see his bed. It's made. I think, did he leave? And then we look to the left, in front of his closet, and he's on the floor. My stuff. So my husband starts to do CPR. I call 911. And then I start doing mouth to mouth, of course. There's no response. You can feel the life is gone. And that was it. That's how I lost my son at 24, who had everything. Going for him, he had everything. But this destroyed his life. What I want you to take from this is two things. A lot of the people who are hooked, they got hooked because they were prescribed opioids. And he was prescribed. But what I also want you to take back, if you know somebody who's using, tell them not to use alone. Because 50% of all the drugs that are out there now have fentanyl in them. And that's what my son got. He didn't get heroin. And it was 100% fentanyl. It wasn't even a little bit fentanyl. It was 100% fentanyl. He didn't have a chance. So I want you to remember that. That if somebody you love or you know somebody that's a user, not to have them use alone and to get naloxone um, that will reverse an overdose.
and you can buy it at the drugstore and you don't have to have a prescription. So if you can remember that, you can take that back, it'll be good. And I just don't want any other family to have to go through what we went through. Um, it is um, not a new drug, opium, um, has been used for over 6,000 years. And it's been used for several purposes. Uh, some was to get high um, because it will create a euphoria. Um, others, they learned very early um, that it's a very effective uh, pain medication. And then it's also a cough suppressant, an anti um, and anti-diarrheal. So they found that from this natural poppy plant, um, there were some uh, very good things that could be treated. But then, like we do, we have to perfect it and make it better. Uh, and opium is part of opiates, um, which are the natural um, opium products that people use. Um, but opioids is what we hear most these days, and that's the full class. That's the natural um, occurring opium or extracted from a plant. And then the opioids are the synthetic um, chemicals. The common, commonly prescribed opioids, oxycodone, oxycodone um, methadone, um, which methadone can be used for pain, um, and it also can be used to treat uh, opioid addiction. Hydrocodone, Vicodin, Percocet, Loratab, and then fentanyl does come in a patch. Uh, and so we've got a multi-generational impact. Um, we've got families losing children um, and children losing parents. So how did we get in this perfect storm? Um, Oxycontin was probably one of the big things that tipped the balance. Um, and that was created um, and FDA approved on a fast track in 1996. And Purdue Pharma um, was the, the ones that got that through and really pushed it out as something that was um, very focused on relieving pain, um, was a great pain reliever, and had a very low addiction risk. Um, they tried to say maybe half of 1%, less than 1% of the people that take Oxycontin um, would get addicted to it. That's not true. <laughs> They, they lied, they hid some data, uh, and that's where a lot of the lawsuits have come about. So what are the risks of addiction? Um, because I, I do think um, that under um, the right circumstances, most of us could develop an addiction. One of the things that happen along the addictive process is you begin to develop tolerance. And with opioids, what we know um, is anyone um, that is put on opioids for a period of time, and it's not even a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, tolerance is going to develop in 100% of the individuals um, within 30 days of continuous use. Mm -hmm. And that tolerance means that you basically won't get the same relief. You're going to need more to get the same effect. Um, well, that was a great hook for the pharmaceutical companies because they could market this product that wouldn't continue to provide the same effect, that you'd always need more. Dependence to opioids can start in seven days. So one short-term prescription. And that's why so many states have come, and North Carolina included, and created legislation to limit that initial dose. Because for somebody who's never taken opioids, they don't need um, a seven or 10 day prescription, or they need to know the risks of taking it. Um, so dependence is when your body's used to that and when you don't have it, you go into withdrawal. And so it's going to make you sick and miserable as you try to come off it. You can be dependent on the opioids without having a full-blown substance use disorder or what we often call addiction. You can be physically dependent um, and you would need to work with your doctor um, to get safely tapered off of that. You wouldn't want to go cold turkey because it would be the worst case of the flu that you've ever had. And most people will not die from opioid withdrawal um, unless they get severely dehydrated. Um, but 
everything I've heard described is want to die because it is the worst pain and discomfort that you've ever experienced trying to come off of the opioids. <coughs> and so again, it was a great way for the pharmaceutical companies to keep business. Treatment does work. Recovery is possible. Treatment works. But, um, and can you treat a chronic disease with a five-day detox or a 28-day program? And I think that's one of the myths that we've perpetuated. But when people finally hit bottom and they want help, they're going to go to one um, detox program and maybe a 28-day program, and then they're going to be fine. We would never think that way in terms of um, a cardiac condition. You have one heart attack, you go in, you have a couple stents, and you're back, you're fine. Don't worry about it again. It's in your rear mirror. Or diabetes. These are chronic conditions that you're going to have to make lifestyle changes and continue um, to work on over years. Addiction control where I ate, if I ate. Addiction control where I slept, if I slept, and who I slept with. Addiction decided whether I was going to lie to you, manipulate you, or steal from you. Ultimately, it decided who I was going to marry. I was the wife of a meth dealer and a daughter of a heroin dealer. Saying it, it didn't start with heroin, and it didn't start with meth. Um, it started with alcohol, and then from there it progressed because addiction is progressive, and if it's not arrested, um, it gets worse. That's what progression means. So what I used became worse, the way I used it became worse, and what I had to do in order to keep using became worse. So from the moment that I first got high, I just remember I loved the way that it made me feel. And I always remember wanting to feel different than what I was feeling. So if I was feeling bad, I wanted to feel good. If I was feeling good, I wanted to feel better. And it seemed like drugs helped with that in the beginning. I thought that drugs were the solution to my problems. I thought that drugs were the life of the party, when in really they were the death of the party. And I was introduced to opioids, and then I was introduced to the needle. And so I started shooting up, and from there that, like Tammy said, um, it became very expensive. Um, I really preferred liquid morphine, but that was really hard to come by, and the pills were hard to come by if you didn't have a prescription. And so I resorted to heroin because my dad sold it, and it was way cheaper and it was easier for me to get. Um, and so from there I just spiraled down, and I found myself in this cycle over and over and over again. And I kept doing the same thing, and the same things kept happening, and I couldn't understand why. You could imagine jumping off a cliff. It might feel like you were flying for a little bit. Living a good life. Flying high, right? Until you hit bottom. Until gravity catches up with you, and then you're met with a shocking impact. And so that's what would happen. I would go to the top of this cliff, and I would jump off, and I would feel so blissful, and, and feel like I'm on top of the world, and everything's going great and thinking I'm flying, and then I hit bottom, and then I get up, and I'm like, man, what just happened? And that's when I would, you know, I would lose the car, and I would lose the job, and I would lose the place to stay. I kept doing this over and over again, and I would go back to the top of the cliff, and, you know, because I found I could shake myself off, and I could go back up to the top, and, you know, I'd go to rehabs, I'd go to detoxes, I'd go to jail, institutions, psychiatric wards, prison, and I always found myself at the top of this cliff, and I would jump off because I would convince myself that it would be different this time. You know? Or I would be at the top of the cliff and I would tell myself that it would be worth it. I knew it wouldn't be different, but it would somehow be worth it. That moment's worth of pleasure for a daytime or even a lifetime full of misery. It'll be worth it. But then it was like it was default and I would go to the top of this cliff and I would look over and I'm like, I'm not jumping, I'm not jumping, I'm not doing this again. I'm quitting. I'm never doing it again. And I meant it with every fiber of my being. I meant it. But I found myself doing it again. Because whenever I first started using, it was a choice. But somewhere along the lines, that choice was taken from me. 
because there were so many times I wanted to quit, but I just couldn't. And by this time, I had jumped off this cliff for the last time, but this time was different. See, this time I couldn't get back up. This time I couldn't shake myself off and I couldn't go right back to the top of the cliff. And this is when I started to really realize that something was seriously wrong. And I had no idea how to help myself. And so this is whenever I started to seek God and I started to seek an understanding. And I found an understanding. And I started to establish a relationship. And I um, developed an intimate relationship with the God that I came to know. And I put my faith in Christ. And I felt something change inside of me. And I gained some momentum. But I still kept going back. Every single time. I started going to church. And I started reading my Bible. And I started to create a prayer closet. And literally all I ever did was spend time with God and in the Word. And read 12 steps in a recovery Bible. But I could only manage for a couple months. And then I would go right back to my husband and I would go right back to the drugs. And so then that's whenever I was led by God to a 12-step program. And from there my life changed because I found a community who could help me. And I realized that I was trying to do it all alone. And I can't do it alone. And I started to learn spiritual principles and I started to take these principles and apply them to every area of my life to cope with life when life happens. And so today I have tools in my belt and I have a community full of people that can help me deal with things and just show me how to live. So today I am a productive member of society. August 1st I celebrated three years in recovery. I'm a student at Gaston College. I'm in the substance abuse program. I'm also a certified peer support specialist and I work for Olive Branch Ministry. I'm a member of the Gaston County Opioid Overdose Response Team. September is National Recovery Month. And so in honor of Recovery Month, um, I wrote something about what recovery is to me. And whenever I read this, I want you to keep in mind that recovery is personal. And it looks different on different people. So my recovery may not look like somebody else's. So just keep that in mind. What is recovery? Recovery is being present in my own life, engaged in my own life, and in others. It is being connected physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to God, to others, and to myself. Because you can be present, but not necessarily connected. Think about Wi-Fi. You can be in the presence of a Wi-Fi connection, but not be connected. In order to make that connection, you must join the network. Recovery is joining and being connected to a network greater than myself. What is recovery? Recovery is picking up the phone when my mom calls. It's coming to family gatherings for the holidays solely because I want to be there and not because I'm wanting to leave with money. It's spending time with family at these gatherings rather than looking at the clock waiting to leave. What is recovery? Recovery is being able to look in the mirror and like who I see. It's being able to look others in the eye, and more importantly, it's being able to look myself in the eye. It's appreciating myself, liking myself, loving myself. It's staying in touch with myself and with God. Recovery is learning, learning how to live, learning how to love, learning how to cook. It's growing, it's maturing, it's adulting. What is recovery? Recovery is he who came so that I might have life and have it more abundantly. While the Chowdhury story may be tragic and unfortunate, there is hope. And today I shine as a beacon of hope. Addiction is real, but so is recovery. Thanks.